Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. All of mankind has an innate desire to be and remain where life is beautiful, where things are good. And as cliche as it sounds, in one way or another, we each have that happy place. A memory of a time or an event that we wish would never end. A memory that we return to almost instinctually when we're confronted with the terrible brokenness of the world. You and I each know the brokenness that this fallen world has, that, that gut-wrenching knot in your stomach when you hear news that you, that you didn't expect, news that you hoped you would never hear, that gut-wrenching knot when sin is so blatantly manifested before your very eyes. Original sin, the corruption of this world. It seems to me that this instinctual desire to go to our happy place is as much a part of who we are as original sin. It's a longing to return to the happy place, that one happy place where it all began, the one happy place from which we were exiled after the stain of original sin entered the world. The Garden of Eden, where life was beautiful, where life was good. Because God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Like you and like me, Peter had this innate desire to be and remain where it is good. And so in the midst of the transfiguration, as Christ's face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light, in the midst of the discussion of Moses, Elijah, and Jesus, the law and the prophets speaking with and discussing with Christ concerning his exodus, literally the word that Luke uses to talk about his crucifixion, his exodus, his journey to the cross, looking forward to that terrible and yet wonderful event by which atonement is made for our sins. And in the midst of all this, Peter, as, as kind of was his habit, he boldly interrupts and says, Lord, it is good that we are here. Kind of the first Captain Obvious, right? Well, that word good that he uses, kalos, noble, beautiful, good. That's the very same word that the Greek version of the Old Testament uses when the Lord says on the sixth day of creation, behold, it was very good. So Peter says, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. It is as if he is saying, Lord, let us be and remain here, here where life is beautiful, where life is good. Here is like the garden. Here I am in the very presence of the true God. And the true man, Christ Jesus. But this was not the first time that Peter interrupted 
and wanted to remain where life is good. After Christ first foretells his death and resurrection, as he, quote, began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Peter again interrupts. He says, far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But just as Christ rebuked Peter then, God rebukes Peter now. For while Peter was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Now this command to hear, it is a command that has been repeated throughout the history of the people of God. A command that is repeated to Peter and a command that is here again repeated to you and I. It is a command to hear for what is being spoken is truth, revelation, the word of God. Recall also what is known as the Shema Yisrael. That's the Hebrew for this great and bold declaration of the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This faith is true. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. Hear. It is a command to hear, to recognize, to pay attention, and to take to heart. It is a command to turn our face to this word, this revelation, this truth. A command to turn our being to Christ. For he is the lamp shining in the dark place, this dark and broken world. Moses heard and turned his face to God. And his face shone as a reflection of that one true light. For when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Well, here, now at the transfiguration, Christ's face, it shines like the sun, not as a reflection of light, but as the source, for he is the one true light. And Christ was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Hear him, Peter. Hear him, you Christian. Turn your face to Christ. That your face, like the face of Moses, might reflect that one true light. Hear now Peter in his second epistle, exhorting you to faith. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And we have something more sure, the prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Men spoke saying, Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Christian. Hear him. 
Hear the Christ. And in hearing God the Father's voice, Peter and James and John fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. Was it a fear of the majesty? Of the power, the irresistible fullness of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Yes. But might also it not have been fear Fear that they could no longer be and remain in this happy place. For Christ was going to the one place that man fears most to go. To judgment, to the cross, and to death. Why do you fear this judgment? Because you are still both saint and and sinner. I know I quote St. Paul a lot, but he's spot on when he says, I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want. The evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Indeed, who will? But Christ, in the very place where he is going. For Christ carries you where you need to go. Maybe not where you want to go. He carries you up to the cross. For Christ was delivered up for our trespasses. And it is Christ who carries you where you want to be, where you need to be, the kingdom. He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. He carries us. He bears us just as he bore our sins to bring us into the kingdom. And how is it that the kingdom comes? That our small catechism teaches that God's kingdom comes when our Heavenly Father gives us His Holy Spirit so that by His grace we believe His Holy Word and lead godly lives here in time and there in eternity. Now the mystery is that Christ is the one who bears us to both places. And Christ himself is both of these places. For in him, in Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Again, St. Peter says, We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place. A lamp shining in a dark and broken world until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Until the kingdom is manifest fully in the here and the now. Christ bears you because you are in Him. You reside in Christ. At your baptism, you were covered by his blood. And so it is that in him, in he with whom God is well pleased, God is well pleased with you. So fear not, little flock. Fear not, dear saint and sinner. For it is the Father's good pleasure to give to you the kingdom, to bear you to the places that you need to go, and to bear you to the place where he so dearly wants you to be. And may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.